Welcome to From the Spectrum Podcast. This is a podcast about autism. It is my goal to explain what is autism. I plan to use a mixture of scientific literature, personal experience, and opinion. With opinion, I will explain why I feel the way I do and give examples. I will provide links to various references for each episode. For each episode, we will discuss various aspects of autism. For today's episode, we will cover mitochondria. The mitochondria, which is plural, mitochondrian is singular, are vast for living organisms. Often, Mitochondria are considered the powerhouse of the cell. We've covered light, water, and magnetism as the central foundation of life, including human life. Today, we will have more understanding of these three critical components in our living organism. Today's episode is an introduction because mitochondria is very critical in this discussion and we cannot cover everything. We will prepare for a future episode featuring an expert, an MD, and a PhD in biophysics to explain the roles of autism and mitochondria. If you go to PubMed and type in just a broad search of mitochondria into the PubMed's search engine. You will see recently, over the last one to two decades, the number of publishings on mitochondria has a vast and sharp increase. The understanding of mitochondria is becoming more apparent. The roles in human biology and health versus senescence and death is becoming more recognized. What we will talk about are not topics that help our life. They are topics in our biology that gives us life. Most cells have mitochondria. All cells except red blood cells and two types of cells from the autism and gastrointestinal episodes, bacteria and archaea. Red blood cells use deuterium water, and you will find out mitochondria's role of producing water. Mitochondria needs a different type of water than blood or hemoglobin. Red blood cells use hemoglobin, which allows optimal oxygen transportation. You will soon find out oxygen in the mitochondria is delicate. Bacteria and archaea, their absence of mitochondria is because those are prokaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells are less complex, and then eukaryotic cells are more complex. All the organelles within a cell nucleus, including mitochondria, it's believed that everything in the cell nucleus was once independent or separate from each other. And the collection of these different organelles coming together in the cell nucleus gives rise to more complex living organisms, to more complex life. In the prokaryotic bacteria and archaea, it shares a cytochrome C oxidase with eukaryotic mitochondria cells. In eukaryotic cells, that more complex cell nucleus in mitochondria, cytochrome C oxidase is the fourth of five cytochromes. We've talked about humans use photosynthesis. This is here. And crucial parts of hemoglobin and mitochondria Hemoglobin and chlorophyll are nearly the same, except hemoglobin uses iron. Chlorophyll uses magnesium. 
Iron will be a critical part for today. Iron in both blood and the mitochondria have magnetic properties. This is a heme, sometimes called hemoprotein. These are molecules containing iron, which binds to oxygen. Remember the magnetic part of the story. Hemes store and transport globins. Hence, hemoglobin conserves energy. Our area for today, photosynthesis and respiratory cytochromes, which will be most of our conversation, is also a catalyst, meaning starting or accelerating. And hemes sense changes in redox states. So more involvement with oxygen. So a brief recap, the elements that we will discuss, it's energy, oxygen, water, proteins, ions, both negative ions, which are electrons, and positive ions, which are protons, and the electromagnetic fields. Light is a driving force. Light, or a lack of light, depending on the cellular state and function. Meaning, if the cell is active and functioning and healthy, it's receiving optimal light, optimal electromagnetic fields. If the cell is lacking, lacking energy, or cell death even, it is neglected from these energy properties. The powerhouse of the cell, the mitochondria, and cellular respiration. There are three components that we will spend most of the time on. These are all energy producing paths. One is glycolysis. Two is citric acid cycle, or sometimes called TCA cycle, or even Krebs cycle. This is briefly mentioned in Cause of Autism episode. Hans Krebs, the Nobel winner, this was mentioned around minute 16 of the Cause of Autism episode. Also, Albert St. Georges, another Nobel winner, has critical roles here with that the protein discovering that semiconduction, essentially what we're talking about, with all of those ingredients mentioned earlier, those elements, we are creating semiconductive properties. And the third component of the cellular respiration is oxidative phosphorylation. This will include the electron transport chain, also briefly mentioned in previous episodes, the ATPase, and chemiosmosis, or the movement of, of ions across membranes and across the gradient. First is glycolysis. This is glucose metabolism that creates two molecules of pyruvate. You probably know glucose is released for energy. This is where it takes action. This is the cell's cytoplasm. The goal is to break down glucose and use a transporter to enter the mitochondria. Glucose binds to insulin and there is a straw-like feature for a transporter, which allows the glucose to enter. Pyruvate kinase isoform, M2, or PKM2, is labeled metabolic budgeting system. This is a factor in autistic biology. Pyruvate has ATP and NADH outputs. ATP is adenosine triphosphate, which transfers energy. This is what we are trying to achieve in cellular respiration. The NADH carries electrons. With oxygen and pyruvate, acetylcoenzyme A, sometimes shown as acetyl-CoA, is created in the citric acid 
The TCA cycle needs it. It needs it. The citric acid cycle. This occurs in the mitochondria matrix and is central driver for cellular respiration. The cycle is used to release stored energy from oxidation of acetylcoenzyme A, which is derived from carbohydrates and fats, or protein, into carbon dioxide and chemical energy of ATP. It also produces NADH and FADH2. These are coenzymes. FADH2 is a cofactor. These are required for metabolism. FADH2 and NADH are catabolism, which breaks down complex molecules, which we've discussed, into simpler forms, simpler molecules. Then mechanisms can use these simple forms for energy. This is life. This is upstream metabolism. NADH and FADH2, the electron carriers, are crucial. We will cover all five of the cytochromes in the electron transport chain and the ATPase momentarily. Both glycolysis and the citric acid cycle uses NAD+, breaking it down to NADH. Glycolysis and the citric acid cycle, which has many components, moving parts, they are like conveyor belts feeding into the cytochromes in the electron transport chain. Now, oxidative phosphorylation. This is where the magic happens, but without glycolysis, and without the citric acid, oxidative phosphorylation suffers. This is the final stage of cellular respiration. This includes the electron transport chain and ATP synthase and chemiosmosis. ATP generated in one of these two metabolic pathways, glycolysis and or oxidative phosphorylation. We've discussed, just briefly, the electron transport chain and the cytochromes involved. Cytochromes are chromophores. In other words, these are a unique type of protein. This translates into color and carriers of. Chromophores, I'll say again, translates into color, and carriers of. It means they absorb specific wavelength of light. And you know the position on the cause of autism and all of the chronic diseases that are just downstream of essentially everything we're talking about today. Today's conversation will take us essentially as far upstream in human functioning, human metabolism, and biological sequencing as we can go. Cytochrome 1, or sometimes called ubiquinone, the products of glycolysis are oxidized here, transferring two electrons from NADH to FMN, or flavin. You might have heard of flavin products, such as green tea or supplemental form. The electrons are then used in CoQ10. You might have even heard about this or seen it on your supplement aisle in your supplement store or grocery store. CoQ10 is a coenzyme, and these are lipophilic. In its reduced form, ubiquinol, also in cytochrome 1, are eight iron sulfur clusters. So here we are with the iron. Remember the magnetic field and hydrogen. 
hydrogen and electrons are produced. They are broken down from these separate processes and produced here. Then we move to cytochrome 2. This uses electrons from succinate in the citric acid cycle. And we are passing electrons down the path using iron sulfur clusters and CoQ10 to cytochrome 3. Succinate is a catalyst of the oxidative process being fed to cytochrome 3, which will turn these products into water. Essentially, we are making water and ATP. You might have heard of ROS, Re Reactive Oxidative Stress. This is cytochrome 3, this process that we're working up to, will take oxygen and create water. The whole purpose of breaking these molecules down into smaller molecules is this. Cytochrome 3 is called cytochrome C reductase. Heme proteins and iron sulfur clusters are used. Heme groups alternate between ferrous and ferric. Proton gradients begin to add up. A two-step Q cycle is used to move into cytochrome C oxidase. This is a transfer and breaking down of processes or elements because cytochrome C can only accept a single electron at one time. So this occurs in two steps. The cytochrome 3 also releases the four protons. And just a special note about the hydrogen too. Hydrogen is building up and is necessary. So we are processing different elements, different molecules, I should say, into the matrix and the intermembrane. And this brings us to maybe the most underrated or not appreciated process in the whole mitochondria, and that's the creation of water. Now, I ran through the first processes to get to this point fairly quickly, and I did not highlight the elements or the molecules that's being produced, the amount of them, and essentially I didn't mention the reasons. However, we are here for these reasons right now. One is to get to cytochrome C oxidase as fast as possible. And two, there are obviously lots of molecules and atomic processes going on here. I want to be mindful of the podcast. I want to be mindful of the information regarding autism. Because you might think, we haven't even talked about autism. However, I would, I would hold off on that thought. So, cytochrome C oxidase. Remember, this has four red light chromophores from the cause of autism episode. From 620 to 860 nanometer light. This process creates water. The electrons we've been transferring and creating, and the oxygen that's being created into water. Light. Remember the light story, the whole purpose of this topic. Light charge separates water. Water equals H plus the hydrogen and oxygen and two electrons. So how does light create more water? We've established light is electromagnetic. Understand it? We've established autism is a light story. Low electrons, low melanin is a modern human phenomena. Also, we've established isolated light, especially blue light, dehydrates cells. Well, this is it. This is where the damage is in the lipid rafts of the process of exchanging these molecules from smaller molecules and transferring them down the process. And here is a big takeaway, because we've now explained the creation of water in the mitochondria. 
not all water is equal. It changes its physics based on the environment it's in. Mitochondria is the reverse process of photosynthesis. Instead of producing oxygen and sugar, like the photosynthesis of a plant, the mitochondria produces carbon dioxide and water. This water is an electromagnetic capacitor. It is a battery. An old car battery uses this process. A key note here is water is a dipole, meaning the electrons as negative charges and protons as positive charges. You know that we are creating electrons and protons, which are crucial ingredients to this process. Now you can understand that the iron and some oxygen and water, the magnetic properties of these elements are crucial. In addition, water is paradosity, meaning it is very responsible for the clock timing mechanisms occurring within this mitochondrial matrix. Our clock timed mechanisms are crucial. And that begins in the SCN. We've discussed the SCN. How and when are all of these elements and these biological ingredients functioning are critical. And another note about the water here in the mitochondria and just water in general. Water is very heat tolerant. And we want our mitochondria to be this heat and dissipative structure. We want massive amounts of energy and production here. Mother Nature chose water. It uses water accurately here. It's by design. Water, with heat tolerant, it can endure so much and be very reliable. And also remember melanin from the Cause of Autism episode how melanin is also very enduring and can absorb all frequencies of light. The light, which is, you know, a vast component of this story, and also within melanin, being that neuroprotective, we've discussed that neuroprotective role here. It keeps this process functioning. Different light has different effects on water has different effects on our electron transport chain. Light has different effects on the glucose getting to the cytoplasm released from the organs. Light, remember the palm sea story. Remember now that we've discussed glycolysis and remember the previous conversations about palm sea, pro, opioid, melano, cortin, and how Cortisol and alpha melanocyte stimulating hormones, the melanin, found throughout the body, on the surface and deep inside of us, in tissues and organs, are implicated from the light source. Melanin here is a different story. Melanin and light takes the water and is the semiconductive properties. It uses this in a dissipative structure. In other words, it is a method of creating more energy. And remember the palm sea and how insulin is generated from here, from CLIP, C-L-I-P. If glucose is affected and insulin sensitivity is infected, the process getting to the mitochondria for glycolysis are implicated. Remember the blue light, our modern light now, about 440 to 480 nanometer light. That's modern LED and tech light. Most, nearly all of the light exposure humans get now falls within this range. And this dehydrates cells. Now maybe you can understand why. We've talked about cytochrome C oxidase. 
These dehydrated cells, the implications to water production from cytochrome C oxidase will cause heteroplasma, which is a decrease of water. And this is where disease manifests in the body. This is lower dissipative ability. Meaning, as we age, water production drops. Okay, so there's, a, there's an understanding that humans are roughly 70% water or so. I don't know what the paradigm suggests, but at birth, we are about 80% water. And that is shown to be, we decrease water about 10% every decade. Now, Doug Wallace is a good source of this, and so is Jack Cruz. As we age and reduce our water production, we need to increase the electrons getting to the mitochondria level to produce more water. We have to supplement our aging and the decrease of electrons with proper, that's key here, proper electromagnetic fields. The melanin story, which is frequently discussed, or mentioned at least, throughout the several episodes of the podcast, this is underrated here too. Melanin charge separates water like no other element or molecule in the human body. And lastly, on the cytochrome C oxidase for now, I mentioned there are four red light chromophores and this one protein. Why are there four red light chromophores in cytochrome C oxidase? Why and how are humans using this? Especially, especially with our modern light. Based on some information from a decentralized neurosurgeon, he has over 10,000 surgeries in his career, he suggests that the red light chromophores in cytochrome C oxidase, where water is produced, links the entire mitochondrial matrix, including the protein metabolism, the TCA cycle glycolysis, and the red light chromophores. Red light is what spins the FO head in ATP synthase, which is the fifth and final cytochrome. Now you can understand, maybe you can kind of attach the rates of autism follows almost identically with the sources of light. One, the timing of artificial light that we are under beginning back in the 1930s with the incandescent type all the way up through the LED production and the shift to LED and now technology. Technology follows essentially every single human being, especially around the ages of 6 to 8, I guess maybe closer to 8 to 10. People are getting cell phones now. And autism is a generational issue. With this light exposure, people's water production is are decreasing, and our melanin inside of us is decreasing. This is why light and melanin are the key candidates for the cause of autism. The light exposure follows identically the rates of autism. And second thing we need to consider is that power source. The sun spectra at 280 to 3100 nanometers our biology is missing those components. Okay, so we make water. And now let's get to the uh, cytochrome 5, which is ATP synthase, ATPase. The hydrogen charge separated in cytochrome C oxidase to produce water. That charge separation are protons. The protons are H plus ions positive charged ions. This is hydrogen. On the ATPase is an FO head. 
FO is a proton channel. In ATPase, the head spins 9,000 to 12,000 times per second. And every three or four spins creates one ATP. Okay, so here's some more magnetic properties here. The FO head, with that spinning, that rapid spinning, creates a magnetic field. This is a quantum nano rotary engine that works on red light. Where are modern humans getting red light? Remember the rant just a couple of minutes ago. The sun is 43 to 47% red, but it requires humans to spend time under it. And remember our photosynthesis. Okay, so why the red light? You remember from the cause of autism episode and probably some other episodes that red light penetrates the body deeper than any other spectra of light, including bones. Red light penetrates bones. And we remember the antioxidant effect here with the, with the cancer treatment. Red light is very powerful against carcinoma and tumors. And that is shown in many, many articles in PubMed. In addition, what people might fail to understand is our mitochondria is where 95% of our melatonin is generated. Melatonin is a light hormone that works at night, the absence of light. And this is our number one antioxidant. So this is all from longer wavelength of light on one side of the sun spectrum. But also, you can kind of come together here and understand that this is more and more of the light story. Light, water, magnetism. With the light story, it doesn't just include those longer wavelengths of light. Vitamin D receptors are involved. Okay, so more sun. This is UVB. Remember the biosynthesis discussed in autism and gastrointestinal problems. It goes, the biosynthesis, it goes pre-vitamin D2 and D3 is 260 nanometer light. Tachysterol, the next process, is 280 nanometer light, and then pro-vitamin D3 is 293 nanometer light. And then we get to vitamin D, the full synthesis of vitamin D is 312 nanometer light. The VDR blocks electron transport chain, but that's okay here. That just means we don't need to eat as much when we are outside. If you've ever noticed that Maybe you don't eat as much whenever you're outside in the sun. That's because that glucose used during glycolysis is kind of supplemented here with the VDR receptors. Our photobiomodulation and the mitochondria as dissipative structures in the sense of nonlinear optics used in human biology. Healthy human biology is built-in mechanism to create energy. And we do this. We've discussed palm C and that release of cortisol and that coincides with glucose. This is what it's all about. We evolved under the sun and its natural electromagnetic fields. We've taken the electrons from the sun and used it for energy production inside of us, inside the so-called powerhouse of the cell. Modern humans and all of our chronic diseases are electron deficient. Most ATP from the cell happens from sun on cytochrome C oxidase and ATPase from infrared and UV on VDR receptors. Now, you can begin to understand the obesity epidemic. Now, 
You can understand type 2 diabetes. Remember, now we've mentioned the insulin sensitivity and the release of glucose and metabolizing all of this energy production. Obesity is a cause of people losing energy to the environment. It's not all cases of calories in versus calories out, food intake, and the lack of movement and exercise. Now, the lack of movement and exercise could be explained here too, because people don't have energy, because they're not, they're not producing water. For the autism story, now you could even understand the roles of autism and metabolism, and autism and inflammation. Cells and our biology are not adapted to our new environments. Are you understanding this? We are adapting, but these are not healthy adaptations. Autism is neuroplasticity to our light and energy change. Research and people's beliefs are in the wrong place. There are all of these autism and XYZ. I am tired of autism and XYZ. I am tired, quite frankly, of, of autism and allergies or autism and eczema or autism and gastrointestinal problems, autism and dyspraxia. Autism has a higher rate of higher chance of Alzheimer and Parkinson's. On that note, you ought to be able to understand a little bit better now the role of light and these rapid cognitive declines that we are now seeing. And I've said, Alzheimer's is a reverse process of autism. Hopefully, you can kind of make sense of this. Now, as we discussed, the cell metabolism, the way that the cell is functioning, the powerhouse, with autism, you know, the problems exist on the cellular level and the synaptic level. The cellular level here is explained. This is why cells aren't developing. Also to note that, remember, our genes respond to the environment. In other words, our environmental signals informs the genes how to respond. The environmental signals are the cues for DNA sequencing. And guess what? In the cell nucleus, the organelle of DNA sequencing and mitochondria are closely related. Genetic studies receives much attention. There's a lot of money thrown at GWAS studies, this genome sequencing and genome-wide understanding. And with autism, there are over 100 so-called risk genes. Now, what this is saying is there are many complicated factors here. There are many genes involved that might cause autism, or it might not cause autism. This because you have duplications or deletions, copy number variants and so forth of this gene, well, it might mean autism. In my opinion, autism research, because of the amount of funding and attention thrown at it with the genes, has reached a dead end. And at the dead end, it takes bulldozers and just kind of barrels through, trying to find some sort of hidden treasure. And this is all wrong. The genes of humans, the DNA, is vastly different than the mitochondria genes. Mitochondria has its own DNA, and there are only 37 total for mitochondria. Now, this is a huge difference. And with everything we've just discussed... You ought to understand that, huh, mitochondria is very important to the cell health, to our life. Not only is it just 37 genes, but the cytochromes, 
the powerhouses, this source of energy, processing these electrons and protons and creating water and creating ATP. There are only 13 DNA responsible of the mitochondria for this function. This meaning 13 genes that we can study to really find out some more information about what is autism. If you're listening to the podcast or listening to the episode, please feel free to leave a review or rating. In podcasting, reviews, ratings, and downloads are crucial. And I very much appreciate your feedback. You can contact me on X at RPS47586. We can have discussions about autism, and especially the cause of autism, these atomic molecular levels. You can email me info.fromthespectrum at gmail.com. And thank you for listening to From the Spectrum Podcast.